Hello, welcome back. Um, we are in, this week we are going to look at the rest of chapter three and the beginning of chapter four. Uh, so this is one of those mini lectures. There'll be five main points, five things that I'll be looking at specifically. So the scholarship in chapter three is a, a selection from Wendy Doniger's book, The Implied Spider. Now, Doniger is a linguist. Uh, she studies Sanskrit, and so she's very familiar with Indo-European linguistics. Uh, Indo-European was the common language that branched out into Sanskrit in India, um, Persian in Iran, um, and also, um, uh, you know, uh, Hittite, uh, ancient Greek, Latin, and then the languages that developed from those uh, ancient German and the languages that developed from those. So <clears throat> the title, The Implied Spider, refers to two things. One is Indo-European itself is a reconstructed language based on the remnants, the web, that imply a spider that it comes from. All right, so, uh, and the same thing is true in her mind from of myth. So she's arguing for a comparative mythology. So you're going to look at myths on a, on, a, on a particular topic across several cultures to see what they share in common. Now, her point is there are common elements in life across every culture, right? Everyone experiences birth. Of course, you don't know it as a baby. I mean, you experience it, but you, you don't remember it. But you can see it when, like, your own child is born. Death, marriage, even things like, like going away from your parents, right, when, when you grow up and move on, all of those would be fairly common things throughout cultures. And so since those are comparable, you can then actually compare the myths from the different cultures with how they answer the question, like how do you deal with that? So her take is going to be the opposite of Malinovsky's. Malinovsky's was the myths only make sense in a particular social context. They don't make sense otherwise. So the Trobriand Islanders myths make sense there. They won't make sense um, with other cultures, and they're not really so much to be compared. Doniger is taking a different point of view. Um, but some of that's because of her own background in a language, Indo-European, that actually has spread across Europe and India, and of course into the New World, because the, a lot of the languages in the New World came from Europe. Um, so you've got this common language going back to some source, and there presumably are some commonalities in culture as well. The uh, comparison section, 3.3, .3, deals with Genesis, the flood narrative. Now, um, of course, everyone's familiar with the flood narrative. Um, the likelihood is that the flood narrative originally came from Mesopotamia, um, where the Tigris and Euphrates, like the Nile River, overflows on a periodic basis. It helps to fertilize the area, but it also, of course, would result in a bad flood year, would result in, in deaths. Um, and so the imagining the idea that there could be a worldwide flood that would wipe out everything, um, you know, except for whoever was smart enough to plan, that's, it, that's the, um, the key sort of common element. But there seems to have been no actual worldwide flood. Um, the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh, um, which is a Babylonian, uh, a Mesopotamian epic, um, makes reference to the flood, but it doesn't actually have the flood narrative itself. Uh, Utnapishtim uh, is one of the characters uh, in uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, and he is a man who survived the flood and has been rendered immortal by the gods, and uh, Gilgamesh goes to see him. The Greeks had their own flood story, uh, the story of Deucalion and Pyrrha. Now, ancient Greece, uh, and even modern Greece, is a uh, water-deprived uh, region. It, it, it's, it's, it's nearly a desert region, or a lot of it is pretty, pretty uh, sparse as far as the amount of rainfall. The rivers, some of the rivers dry up in the summertime, so there is actually no river. Um, and uh, in that sort of culture, the idea that there could be a flood probably is somewhat alien, so the Greek 
uh, flood narrative almost certainly comes from elsewhere, um, and then the Greeks make it their own. Um, and each one of those is different. Decayla and Pyrrha, for instance, pretty much just save themselves, uh, and then they repopulate the earth by throwing rocks over their shoulders because they're told to find the bones of their mother and then throw them over their shoulders, and then that's how they repopulate the earth. And initially they think, well, you know, we don't even know where our mother's grave would be. Pure, uh, they would be the children of Pandora, actually. Uh, well, Pyrrha would be. Um, so how do we, you know, how can we possibly find that? Um, and then they realize, oh, well, Mother Earth and the bones would be the rocks. So if we throw them and what happens is the rocks hit the ground and they become people. Um, so that's sort of the, that popu population story, but the bit about the animals really isn't, isn't covered in that story. Uh, the, the Nachleben section in chapter three uh, has two poems, um, which tell the story of Leda and the Swan. Um, uh, there's Yeats's, William Butler Yeats's poem, Leda and the Swan, and then there's also Hilda Doolittle, who w went by the name H.D., um, called just called Leda. So the story of Leda and the Swan is briefly this. Um, Zeus sees Leda, who is the queen of Sparta. She's married to a guy named Tyndareus, and uh, Zeus, of course, has you know wants wants her for as a sexual conquest. And to get close to her, he transforms himself into a swan. Now, in some versions, even ancient versions of the story, the swan then attacks Leda when it gets close, or it's actually comforting, almost like a, a cute little pet, and it sort of seduces Leda. Well, which of those versions is it? Okay, which version? And here we get both sides of that. Yeats takes a view of the violence of a god basically uh, taking possession of a mortal, and Leda taking a much more sort of dreamy quality, has her poem has a dreamy quality, which sounds more like a seduction. In other words, Leda is a willing participant. Um, and if you look at it more in terms of like the connection between humans and, and God, would that be a good thing, a welcome thing, or would it seem to be a big intrusion? Chapter four is the main characters are Demeter and Hades, but Demeter is the one who's gonna get the most attention in chapter four. Uh, Hades does get some description in Mauricio's part of the chapter uh, and definitely you know, uh, absorb what she has to say about Hades. Hades is not the same as death. He is the king, king of the dead. Uh, he's not feared. I mean, everyone's gonna die. Um, and he's not portrayed as evil. So like, even though I love James Woods, James Woods' portrayal of Hades in um, uh, Disney's Her uh, Hercules, um, he turns him into sort of like a villain. Hades is not that figure. Um, the One of the other things that Maurizio does is she does do this elaborate geography of the underworld. That's great, but I want to emphasize one thing. The oldest version we have of de that deals with the afterlife, the oldest poem that we have, is um, from Homer's Odyssey. Odysseus travels to the edge of the earth of, of the world, and remember the Greeks, the, the ancient Greeks would have seen the world as a, a disc surrounded by the river ocean. So if you travel all the way out, you're going to hit the river ocean. Then you're if you went far enough, you'd actually bump into the dome, which is the sky. Or, and also maybe bump into part of the lip of the bowl, which is the underworld. And so if you go that far, if you go that close to the edge, then the, go the ghosts are fr pretty close to the surface and they can come up and visit. So Homer's vision of the afterlife is that it's basically this gloomy gray area that the dead inhabit. And it's it's no fun. It's not a place of punishment, but it's, it's just sort of boring and gray and... Uh, the dead all wish they were alive and, and they, all they want to know when someone dies and shows up in the underworld is like, what's the latest news? What, what, what was going on when you died? Like, you know, because we, you know, we've been down here a while and we, we're out of the loop. 
later they start to develop this elaborate um, geography with like five rivers in different regions of the underworld and so forth. Uh, it's worth knowing that. Just know that that is, was not a constant throughout Greek literature. And in fact, ancient Greeks did not necessarily believe in an afterlife. There were some Greeks, some Greek philosophers especially, who believed there was no afterlife. And that the fact that there was no afterlife meant that humans were free to live their lives. Right? Because if, if, you, if you're only doing the right thing because, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to get judged and then you're going to end up in a place of punishment. Well, that sort of thing, that's not, that's not truly doing good. That's basically acting out of fear. And so let's get rid of that. You know, be a good person just to be a good person. You don't need to have a reward because there's no reward or punishment. So, you know, live your life now. Uh, and there were philosophers who, who preached that and who believed that. Uh, there were some who believed in reincarnation. There are lots of different things going on. So not everyone believes in sort of the constant afterlife that, that is usually described in books like Maurizio. Uh, it's worth reading it, but just keep in mind that that is not a universal. The main literary thing in chapter um, 4.1 4 is Homeric Hymn number 2, which is Homeric Hymn to Demeter. Now, the Homeric hymns, there are 31 of them. Uh, they get the, got the title because in the ancient world they were attributed to Homer. So, they're, like, ancient authors would say things like, as Homer says in his, his hymn to Demeter, and then there's a quote from the Homeric hymn to Demeter. It is almost certain that none of the poems uh, that are called Homeric hymns are by Homer. Uh, or even the Homeric school. They just got attributed to Homer. So it's, it's a useful t title, but it doesn't actually mean that Homer composed these works. The Homeric hymn number two tells the story of the kidnapping or the rape of Persephone by Hades. Now, uh, this is by arrangement with Zeus. So this is basically a marriage. Hades is coming to collect his bride. Now he does it by force and by a trick. Um, and he basically sort of grabs her, he snatches her. That's what the word rape means in, in Latin. Rapio means to snatch. So he grabs her and then takes her to the underworld. Demeter is distraught at the loss of her daughter. Uh, and then she, you know, causes a famine to happen and a bunch of other things happen. Um, but th eventually what happens is Persephone is ordered released by Zeus, but because she ate something in the underworld, she ate some pomegranate seeds, she has to spend in some versions, three, you know, three or four months, in some versions, six months, but she has to spend a portion of the year in the underworld, and then the rest of the time she spends above ground with her mother. Um, so that, that's the arrangement. Because she ate something, she can't come back full time to her mom. Now, the eating of pomegranate seeds likely is code for she had sex with Hades. In other words, she became Hades. Um, consort and therefore she has a, an obligation she's bound to him in some way Th that's that's certainly one way to look at it now the one of the things that came out of this hymn or this hymn was written to support were the Eleusinian mysteries now this was a mystery cult uh, that was headquartered in Eleusis which is a, t a town about 14 miles outside of Athens outside of ancient Athens it's probably actually part of the city of Athens today. It's probably like a neighborhood in, it'd be like Independence, Missouri, which is just beyond Kansas City. You know, you could walk there. You could walk to downtown Independence from downtown Kansas City. It'd be a hike. It can be done. The same thing with the Eleusini Mysteries. And they had an, an annual uh, mystery uh, that, that would happen at the end of September, beginning of October. Uh, so right around harvest time. And what, would, what it would involve would be uh, you would go there, uh, you would participate in some rituals in Athens. Um, you had to be ritually pure so you couldn't have uh, blood guilt. Uh, uh, and if you would kill a family member, even accidentally, you were ineligible, you could not participate. You had to be sponsored by someone who was already a, a, a member of the cult. Um, you would travel to Eleusis, and in Eleusis, they put you like in this, this dark big hall called the Telesterion, and in that big hall, 
there were some sort of revelations that happened. Uh, you were fasting maybe for the entire time ex uh, until the very end of the, uh, the nine day period. Um, if that is the case, uh, we know that there was a dr drinking of some sort of ale, some sort of uh, alcoholic or you know um, somewhat intoxicating beverage that was drunk, that was made from grain uh, as before you went into the telesterion. Tel if in fact you were, had not been eating a lot, then that would have much more of an effect. It would you'd be much more suggestible in doing the doing the, the mystery. But it, apparently the mystery, what it offered was a vision of the afterlife where when you died, you had a friend because Persephone, you were a de devotee of de, um, Demeter and therefore of Persephone. And when you went to the underworld, you had the queen of the underworld who had your back. Um, so the people who underwent the mysteries and they were forbidden to talk about them in any, any detail said that it was a life-changing experience. So this would be such akin to people who were born again Christians. Something happened in, in that ritual that sort of blew their minds and really changed their life in some way. Um, so it was a very powerful um, r religious experience. Uh, it had life-changing effects and it was very popular and stayed popular even into the time when Christianity becomes the state religion. There were still some hangers on um, and this hang, hung on for a while, uh, so, but then eventually it faded out because it, as Christianity took you know, greater hold, then the pagan stuff went by the wayside. Um, so that'll be it for this time and we'll see you next time.